With massive layoffs in nearly every sector, weakness in manufacturing, car sales and housing, and the biggest one-month decline in the trade deficit since the financial crisis, the economic picture is not looking good. Bottom line, now is the time to own gold, which is why the experts at Stansbury Research just stepped forward with a major gold prediction, arguing gold could soar as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly even higher. You can find out why and get instant access to their number one gold investment today. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. But in the past, this gold strategy could have made you nearly 50x your money. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving in recent weeks, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains these experts believe are in store for this gold stock. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to goldmaniareport.com. Again, that's goldmaniareport.com for a free copy of his new report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone, and welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show. Well, the U.S. bond market is on the move, rapidly shifting from warning of a recession to signaling interest rates are staying higher for longer. Here today to talk about this and so much more is uh, the bond king, Alf. Pecatello, I know you might be thinking of someone else, but he is truly the king. Alf uh, of uh, the Macro Compass, always good to be with you. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Daniela, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I wish we could be uh, speaking, uh, you know, under better times uh, against the world backdrop. But uh, we do need your expertise here, Alf. Uh, give us your insights on what we're seeing uh, in the bond market as we're speaking right now the benchmark 10-year treasury yield was down nearly 14 basis points at 4.6 percent well the volatility in bond markets is all over the place right so the levels we're talking about today might not be the same in a day from uh, from uh, today but look the overall story is the following for about nine months 12 months everybody was waiting for a recession and everybody was positioned for it. So the curve was deeply inverted, signaling that the recession would be upcoming immediately. The reality is that Biden has printed one and a half trillion dollars in fiscal deficits over the last fiscal year in the US between October 22 and October 23. All that money printing has helped the US economy to stay off and to fend off a recession. And so everybody has to reassess their own odds. Now, what happens late in the cycle every time, in late 2007, in late 2000, or at the end of 2018, is that the bond market gets excited, that this time is different, the economy can handle higher interest rates, bond yields shoot up just when the economy is lowing and something ends up breaking. Well, that's what I was going to say, because you've been warning that if history is proven correctly and if left unchecked, the steepening is likely to cause serious damage to equity markets. And, and the economy overall. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the inversion of the yield curve is a leading indicator of a recession. Leading means there is a lead time until between the, the inversion and the recession. Now, what happens is this lead time tends to be anywhere between 12 months and 24 months. We are now at month number 17 after the inversion. Now, we are basically going into the red hot zone of these lags, the famous macro lags. So we are entering a period when over the next six to nine months something could go wrong. And historically, it's when the yield curve steepens. After having been inverted, it steepens back. So also long-term bond yields, in other words, move higher very late in the cycle. That's when most of the damage gets done. And why is that? It's pretty simple. So first, if you push third-year mortgage, uh, if you push third-year treasury yields higher, one of the first outcomes is third-year mortgage rates will also move higher aggressively. We are now almost to 8% third-year mortgage rates. And at some point, this relentless move higher in mortgage rates will end up causing trouble in the real estate market. Pension funds go under pressure, insurance companies, banks, all these entities that are heavily invested in long-term bonds actually suffer much more when the curve steepens and long end interest rates go up, especially if the economy is weakening at the same time. It's the steepening after the inversion that makes a lot of damage and generally signals that something is about to break. But, okay, what about obviously the, the, the conflict in the Middle East? Adding to the safe haven, um, rush to safe haven play here, Alf? So that's a bit offsetting all of this, right? We have seen this bear steepening, this move higher in long-term yield, and then at some point you get this confrontation between, um, you know, in the Middle East. 
And what happens is that treasuries are still seen as a safe assets, right? right? I mean, what happens is that all the allocators that have invested in equities and in other risky assets, they tend to go to the safety of treasury yields, especially if they're yielding 5%. Now, the irony in all of this is that these tensions tend to cause oil prices moving higher. And while everybody's sitting on this disinflationary camp, if you get a few months of, of this conflict um, protracting, then oil prices could move higher and could also lead to an inflationary acceleration, therefore challenging the idea that the Fed is done. So it's not so obvious to say treasuries will continue rally just because there is tension and therefore there are safe assets. Well, that brings me to my next point. What's your gut feeling? Is the Fed done? So I would say they're done. Uh, but the reason why they're done is that the bond market, through the sell-off in the long end for the last two to three months, has done a lot of work for them, has made the mortgage rates higher, has made corporate borrowing costs prohibitively high, Daniela. So basically, it's tightening the conditions on their behalf. So if you look at their situation, they're looking at a job market which is still weakening. They're looking at inflation which slowly is getting under control. The bond market is doing the work for them. So I think if you ask me today, I think they're done. The problem is not if they're done or not, but how long do they want to keep policy at this level? Because what they told us with the latest dot plot, their own projections, Daniela, is that they want to keep federal funds rate above the level of inflation, at least by 1% or 2%, for 24 to 27 months. Now, that's a very long period of time where to take federal funds rate above inflation, because last time they did that was in 2006 and 2007. Do you remember the Federal Reserve hiked the interest rates to 5 25% back then? Inflation slowed down in 2007. We were already at 2.5%, but these guys didn't cut rates. They kept Fed funds at 525 so they kept this policy tight for so long until eventually something broke. And that's what worries me. They are not talking about cutting rates even if inflation slows down. They're really talking about this higher for longer story, which ultimately will cause damage. And we're entering the periods where the macro lags are more likely to kick in because the curve has been inverted already for 17 months and it's now steepening back. And that's why you say that's what worries you the most? So what worries me is this transition. When, in the, when the yield curve has been inverted for 16 to 17 months, you are entering the period where it's more likely that you are going to see the lagged negative impact on that on the economy and on the markets. Now, if on top of that, you get a steepening now, which even makes mortgage rates higher, makes yeah. corporate borrowing costs higher, right when the economy is lowing. Oh, that's a terrible cocktail. Do you remember in 2018, Daniela, just to bring a very uh, short-dated example, Powell, in September 2018, he was hiking rates and hiking rates and hiking rates because the Trump tax cuts in 2017 had supported the economy. So he wanted to cool it down, and he was hiking, hiking, and hiking. And the economy did okay, but at a certain point, he said, no, 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 we are far from neutral rates. We need to, hi to hike much more. And then ultimately, what happened? Well, the stock market froze in December 2018. Apple drew down 25% in six weeks and he was forced to come to the rescue. The difference is time is that he cannot. And if we're going down memory lane, this tweet of yours made me chuckle. You said back in 2021, people were arguing the Fed raising rates to 2% would break everything. Well, that's always a story. So I've been taught while running money that narratives are really important because people get caught in them and they really believe and they push them to extremes. That's the problem mm. with narratives. If you remember in 2021, everybody was saying the Fed cannot hike. If they hike mm -hmm. to one or two percent, exactly. it's over. The world is going to yep. fall apart. Yep. But it, this, this was ignoring the fact that many Americans had locked in mortgage rates for third year fixed. So even if you hike interest rates, Somebody who has already locked interest rates for a long period of time won't be negatively impacted by that, right? I want you to help me understand what's happening on the dollar index uh, now. Uh, you know, down 30 basis points, bringing it back down below 106, Alf. Why the pressure on yeah. the dollar index? So look, the dollar went up together with bond deals, right? And so what's yeah. the story there? If you are raising interest rates, you're making it tougher and tougher for borrowers to borrow. And when they can't borrow, especially foreign borrowers, especially Chinese corporates, Brazilian corporates, any other uh, entity outside the United States which has dollar debt. And Daniela, there are $12 trillion of dollar debt 
issued by countries and corporates that are outside the United States. So these guys don't have dollars. They borrow in dollars, but they don't have access to organic flow of dollar. They only can get it from selling stuff. So China would sell goods, Brazil will sell commodities, and they will get the dollar they need to pay their dollar debt, right? Now, what happens if interest rates are moving up very rapidly and the economy is lowing? When interest rates are moving rapidly, borrowing costs go up, the economy is lowing, you see where China is today. They can't get their hands on organic dollars, so they're forced to go in the market and buy these dollars to repay their debt. So it's the deleveraging effect that happens when the economy is slowing down and interest rates are going up in a world where everybody is leveraged in dollar. Well, that, I'm happy you brought that up because what do you say when people are like, well, that will force the Fed, they're going to have to come in and just you know, buy back the bonds or whatnot. I mean, what's your response there? Well, I'm going to say to them that that's all nice and dandy when inflation is 2%. Back in 2019, the Federal Reserve came in super quick. Do you remember Powell in January 2019, after the stock market decline of December, came in and said, well, sorry, guys, we have tightened too much. I didn't mean it. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to be more dovish. And the S&P rallied by 30%. Now, the problem this time is that if we get a problem somewhere in a foreign market or even in the domestic equity market, core inflation is still over 4% in the U.S., Daniela. So how can Powell say, here, sorry, I, I was wrong? So what people don't understand is that this time, if the Fed makes the mistake of keeping policy too tight, the damage it can do, it's really, really large because it cannot come in and immediately change their tune because inflation is still too high. So the damage they can generate is pretty, pretty hard. How much of a pivot will the Middle East crisis create or not? Nothing for the time being. So basically what I think Powell needs to see before he pivots are two things. Either he's very lucky and inflation continues to slow down, and then at that point he will be able to pivot at some point. You know, he's comfortable that inflation is getting back to 2% and he can start cutting rates. But he needs to be very lucky for that. Otherwise, what I think is more likely is that this higher for longer story will end up causing some serious trouble somewhere. And I don't know where. It could be the real estate market. It could be a foreign market that is under trouble. But when the damage gets big enough, then he will be forced to pivot. The difference with the other times is that because inflation is still 4%, the damage needs to be really large to convince him to come in and say, even if inflation is still 4%, I am forced to ease, I'm forced to cut rates. Alf, let's uh, wrap up with the safe haven talk again. Uh, why are we not seeing a flight to safety to gold? So gold has been really interesting because central banks have been buying it despite of what the price was, despite of what the uh, relationship with real yields that has broken up over the last one and a half years, we are normally used to see real interest rates move up and gold move down, Daniel. And this time we mm -hmm. got the opposite. We got real yields moving up and gold didn't care. It kept mm -hmm. trading well. That's because there were price insensitive buyers. Foreign central banks came in and they wanted less bonds, more gold, more hard assets. That was the result of basically what the U.S. did to Russia with sanctions over their reserves. So central banks said, well, I don't want treasuries that much. I want less treasuries and more gold, less European bonds and more gold. So gold prices have been supported very aggressively. But now in the latest lag, what happened is a bit different. Interest rates have been pushed out across the curve. So even 10-year and 30-year interest rates have gone up. You have to think about gold as a strong form of money that you cannot print, you cannot expand, but also gold doesn't carry coupons. When 10-year treasuries and 30-year treasuries, so long-end instruments, also start yielding 5%, then they compete with gold temporarily. They compete harder against gold. And so temporarily, gold can take a drawdown. I'm still very positive on gold. I think gold belongs in the portfolio because it has special features and properties that only gold can deliver. If we debase, if we do something funny monetary-wise, it's not equities or bonds that will do particularly well, or not other commodities, but gold. Gold will be the asset that protects your portfolio against that particular monetary well, funny I mean, experiment. Let's do you say. want to be long cash here, Alf? I mean, what are you, what are you doing? So my main macro tilt in the portfolios that I provide for clients is to 
reduce the exposure to equity markets, and that's especially if you get these rallies, you know, these euphoria-driven things on artificial intelligence or whatever the narrative is, Daniela. At this point of the cycle, just reduce your equity exposure. Get your dollar cash, it pays you 5%, and be patient. There will be moments, like in July this year, where everybody will be pointing at you like, you're stupid, you don't have uh, artificial intelligence stocks. The reality is that a bit later you get a drawdown. We're in a phase of the cycle where it's safe to be prudent, let's say. Gold is another asset I like in the portfolio right now because it can make money pretty well in a recession. But generally speaking, less equities, more cash is what I would suggest. And you have brought a gift for our viewers today. Yes. Because we talk a lot about the bond market, Daniela, I wondered, you know, why are people not really digging deep into it? And the answer is it's full of jargon and technicalities. It's very it is. hard. It is. Now, I'm lucky. I've been in the business. I've run a $20 billion bond fund. So I've learned a lot about it, and I wanted to share it with people from A to Z to unpack all this bond market. So I made a bond market course for people, which is now online on my website. And also, I thought, to encourage people to go in there dig in and participate in the bond market course, I wanted to give away a 20% discount to the first 50 people who will sign up. Because you obviously believe there's tremendous opportunity in this market if you understand it. Yes, I mean, if people don't understand bond markets, I think they are not really equipped to protect their savings. Because, you know, every time you interview me, but also other people as I follow your channel, bond markets always come up as a topic the entire time, either tangentially or directly. Bond markets affect all yep. other asset classes and they will keep affecting markets going forward. So it's important for people, I think, to realize and go there and dig deep and um, study bond markets. The discount code is BOND20OFF if people want to use it. Alf Picatiello, it's always a pleasure. And I also have an announcement because we are headed to the Stansbury Alliance uh, Conference. If you'd like to join us, it's uh, not too late. You can sign up at dannyvegas2023.com. Again, that's dannyvegas2023.com. Alf, as always, thank you. Thanks, Daniela. And I hope to speak to you um, in, in better times uh, for humanity. Thank you, Alf. And thank you all for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show and sign up at danielacamboni.com. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.